Welcome to the Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Mark Clements, in-depth, relevant biblical teachings will help you in life and living in today's world. Now, let's join Pastor Clements in the service already in progress. Great to be in church with you. I love church. I love God's house. I love God's people. I love God's presence. I love the worship of our God. I love the study of our God. Amen. Amen. We're studying right now on this subject of righteousness, right standing with God. It is a truth in God's word that we saw in our study in Hebrews chapter 5 that is a basic truth. And it even says that uh, every every Christian should cut their teeth on this truth. It says those that need milk are unskillful in the word of righteousness. And, and so we, we're, we're teaching this, not because those of you who are more mature as a Christian, uh, not, not to bore you, uh, I haven't been bored whatsoever. In, in this study or in presentation of this particular truth. Righteousness simply means right standing with God. Let's look at a couple of verses. Uh, right standing with God. First of all, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and then 1 Peter chapter 2, and then Romans. I'll let you find those. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 2, and then Romans chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says that God, he made him Jesus. God made Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. That's 121, thank you. There we go. For he has made him Jesus to be what? He made him to be sin for us, though he knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Some of your translations say through him. There is no righteousness outside of Jesus Christ. There is no right standing, no matter how good a person is, no matter how benevolent a person is, no matter how generous a person is, no matter how kind a person is. <laughs> no matter how happy a person is, no matter how spiritual a person is, there is no righteousness outside of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, He bore our sins in His own body when He hung on the cross. He bore our sins in His own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness or could live unto righteousness, or would live unto righteousness. He knew no sin, yet God made him to be sin. He bore our sin in his own body on the tree. Isaiah chapter 53 said, The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He laid on him the iniquity of us all. So that's how righteousness starts. It's how righteousness begins. We shared with you last week from Romans chapter 3 out of the New Living Translation. I don't use the New Living Translation uh, <clears throat> all the time. Uh, it's just good for these particular verses. The New Living Translation, and I'm not sure, I, I, did we have a screen that, that, that all of those uh, were on? You just look in your Bible at Romans chapter 3. First of all, we'll, we'll get back over to, <clears throat> to Romans chapter 5 in just a moment. All right, see all these verses? Let's look real carefully at these. We are made right with God. That's what righteousness means. Righteousness means being right with. And in this tense and in this uh, study, being right with God. Because there's only two groups of people in, 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 in the entire existence, those who are right with God and those who aren't. And they're called unrighteous, not right. 
not right with God. And that's not something that you as a human being can determine. Well, I think if I do A, B, and C, I think then I should be, that, that, that should be good enough. That, that's, that's not your prerogative. That's right. God is God, always will be, and he's the one that sets the standard. And the standard he set for being right with him is accepting his son as Lord and Savior. He gave his only begotten son. That's God's plan. Human beings had no part of that. Even after all the prophesying had been done in the Old Testament and everything had been completed and everything had been fulfilled, there was 400 years that are known as the four centuries of silence. There was no scripture. There, there, was, there was nothing. There was nothing. And then finally, one day, one day, this man named, named Zechariah was in performing the duties of the priest and an angel appeared to him and said, I'm Gabriel, come from the presence of Almighty God and you're going to have a son and he's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. John was six months older than Jesus and, and, and uh, uh, that same angel then went to another young lady named Mary and said, Hail, you're going to have the Messiah. She said, you're looking at the servant of God. Behold the handmaiden of the Lord. Be it unto me according to your word. And, and God sent his only son, John 3, 16. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's design. Society strains against it and struggles against it and says, well, that can't, it can't be that narrow. Well, this is God's plan. It's not human's plan. Human's plan says we need to include everybody. Human's plan says there's got to be a hundred different ways up the mountain. God says there's one. God says there's one. I sent my son, and if you'll put your faith and trust, reliance, hope, and confidence in him and what he did on the cross of Calvary, if you'll trust in his sacrifice instead of your own works and your own accomplishments and your own achievement and your own life, if you'll accept him, I'll accept you. You accept him, I'll accept you and make the declaration and the proclamation that now you are right with me. That's right standing with God, right righteousness. So back to our verses there in the uh, Romans chapter, in the third chapter of Romans, we are made right with God, notice it, by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. And again, that's part of that conversation of uh, do Jews need to be born again? Do Greeks need to be born again? What about Gentiles? You know, who, uh, <clears throat> are there some who can just work their way in? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, By God's grace you're saved through faith. That not of yourself, that's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any of us should boast. And so if there was a way to work our way in, then we could boast. Then we could be arrogant about it. Then we could pat ourselves on the back. Then we could brag a little bit and say, well, the rest of you needed help, but I got in because I never did this, and I, I've never been involved in that, and, 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 and because I've, I've, I've got a perfect attendance record at Sunday school. And no, no, it's nothing of you. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And your faith in him and accepting and receiving what he did for you. Back to our verses. We're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. This is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's, God's glorious standard. Yet God in His grace freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Jesus Christ, whom he, when He freed us from the penalty of our sins. God, in His grace, freely makes us right in His sight. Notice the last line right down at the bottom there in verse 26. He makes sinners right in His sight when they believe in Jesus. That, 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 that's as simple as the proclamation and the declaration that you are now right with God. And yet, and yet, people struggle with that. People wrestle with that.
People love, it seems, to beat themselves up and say, well, I, I just don't feel right with God. I don't, it doesn't seem to me like I'm right with God. I've done so many bad things, and I don't think anybody as worthless as me you know, could, could be right with God. And they struggle against the truths of the Bible. They'll even fight the, the, the preacher that's proclaiming the truth of God's Word. I grew up in church. I grew up in Sunday school. No one ever taught me that I was the righteousness of God in Christ. They didn't teach that. And I remember the first minister that, 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 that I'd ever sat under and, and received instruction. It was like, it was like, oh, my heart wanted to believe it. But there was just something holding me back, and I just didn't think I, I just couldn't accept it. Because, because the truth of God's word hadn't, hadn't dawned on my heart yet. And faith comes by hearing and hearing. And it took a number of times. And I remember in one of his messages, he said that, that people would come after services and they would just fight him over that. And they'd say, well, you taught that we're the righteousness of God, that we're right with God now. And he said, yeah, I plead guilty. That's what I taught. It's in the Bible. He looked, that person didn't have a Bible. So go back and get your Bible and I'll show it to you. And they turned and they stopped and they said, Bible or no Bible, I know it's not so. You can't help a person like that. If you're going to argue with God's word, if you're going to wrestle against God's word, I got a verse for you. Job chapter 9 and verse 4, second half of the verse. Who has ever contended against God and won and been successful? No, you, 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 can't, you can't strain against God. And put my verses back up there, please. And you, 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 you just have to read God's word, take God at his word. Jesus was sacrificed for your sin. And if you, if you do that, your life changes. If not, you remain miserable. Yeah. Nobody can do it for you. This is what the Bible says. It's only, it, 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 the Bible will never change. It's the only thing the Bible's ever going to say. Yep. Doesn't matter how you feel about it or what you think about it. But he said again and again, people would come and they just want to fight against. I'll help you be a, be, a, be a successful Christian, be a happy Christian, be a joyful Christian. Just believe what the Bible says. Amen. This is called living by faith. This is called walking by faith. Living by faith and walking by faith is not, is not saying, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to psych myself up here now. I'm going to want to believe God. And I'm gonna, I'm just, that's not living by faith. Living by faith, just, just believe what the Bible says. Just take God at his word. That's what Abraham did. And Romans 4 tells us all about it. He just took out his word. God said it. I believe it. It's, it's a done. It has nothing to do with how you feel or what it seems like or whether or not you can believe it. I'm right with God. I'm right with God. Who's your Savior? Who's your Lord? I, I wish there was a little more enthusiasm in your voice. Convince me. Where's your, who's your trust in? Jesus. Who do you rely upon? Jesus. Who? Jesus. Who? Jesus. Don't talk yourself out of the blessings of God. Oh, <laughs> Over to chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. He's going to talk in these verses about the gift of righteousness. But not as the offense, so also came the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. For not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense, this is Adam, if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness Hallelujah. shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men 
unto justification of life. Sin came upon the entire human race, not because you committed a sin, but because the original man, Adam, sinned. And condemnation came upon all. But the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, obeyed God, did right in his sight, was tempted in every way, yet never sinned, resisted the devil, and he fled from him. He was found to be right with God, and anyone who accepts him and makes him their Lord is declared and decreed to be right with God. That's, that's, it may not be a, a, a completely appropriate and proper way to term it, but that's the first half of righteousness. That's part of righteousness, right standing with God. It's positional. It's an initial declaration. It's your standing with God. You're right with him. Righteousness is also right living before God. It's demonstrated. It's a demonstration. It's in practice. It's an ongoing declaration. It's your conduct. It's practical. One is a pronouncement and an announcement and a declaration and a decision by God. One is the evidence that you're right with God. And that's called right living. Now, we, we've, we've given you a number of illustrations and a number of, 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 of verses along that line. Uh, let me give you just a couple more in regard to right living and right conduct and right practice. Look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And verse 29, 1 John 2, 29, if we know that he is righteous, <laughs> ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. There's a difference between being declared righteous and doing righteous, doing right in his sight. Now, the translation that I'm looking at right here says everyone who practices righteousness is born of God. Look at 2 Timothy, a few pages to the left there in your Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22. Flee youthful lusts, but follow after, what's the first thing listed there? Follow after righteousness. Faith, love, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now again, a different translation here that I'm looking at uh, says, flee youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness. But pursue righteousness. Well, you don't have to pursue right standing with God. Following and pursuing and seeking to be right with God is in practice, and that's in your daily life. That's in your daily conduct. Once you're decreed and declared to be right with God, that's taken care of. Now you have to live that righteousness out. Again, Matthew 6.33. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's what's right in his sight. Again, we read that, that you've now been declared right in his sight. Now you're seeking to live and conduct yourself and to be right in his sight and to pursue that and to practice that. Back to 1 John, a couple of these verses. 1 John chapter 3. And verse 7, <coughs> little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. It's the evidence. It's the evidence that you're right with God. 
even as he is righteous, Christ. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Verse 10 there says, he that doeth not righteousness is not of God. He that doeth not righteousness is not right with God. Here's a good verse. Book of Ezekiel. You might just want to look up this one on the screen. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 18. Ezekiel 18 and verse 5. But if a man is just, but if a man is just and, what's the word just mean again? means declared righteous. Whenever you see justified, you've been justified by the Lord. That means you've been declared righteous. That's what that word means, justified. He declared you to be right. So if you're just, you're declared right with God, decreed, announced, pronounced by God to be right. And this verse says, if a man be just and, and what? And doeth what is lawful and right. So there's a difference between being declared right and doing right. You can be declared right and do wrong. You can be declared right with God and still falter and fail as a Christian. Do I have to get more plain? Some of you are looking at me like, what are you saying, Pastor? What I'm saying is you can be a Christian and sin. You can do things that God forbids. You can do things that are displeasing to God. That doesn't mean you lost your salvation. It doesn't mean you're no longer right with Him. Now, uh, <clears throat> Roger, I'm going to pick on my son-in-law. It's my son-in-law, Roger. Married my daughter. Good move. The day they got married, I welcomed him into our family. He is legally my son. That's what son-in-law means, legally. If he blows it, does something stupid, don't. <laughs> he doesn't cease to be my son. He's been welcomed into the family, and if he does something dumb, I'm going to tell him about it. And I'm going to give him an opportunity to get it right and fix it. Like, button your suit. Okay, all right, don't button your suit. <clears throat> fix your button. Comb your hair. Shave. No. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you. He's still part of my family. He's still part of my family. And if he gets mud on his shoe, if, if he's got, you know, a little leftover egg bake, you know, on his beard, he cleans it off. Yeah. He just cleans it off. See, 1 John 1 and verse 9 is not written to the world. It's written to the church. It's written to believers. And it says, it says, if we confess our sins. How many of you have ever confessed a sin to the Lord? If you confess your sin, and again, see, people try, people, they just fight against the truth of the Bible. Well, I don't think I'm forgiven. Well, the Bible says, if you confess your sins, have you confessed it? Lord, I sin. Confess it. He's faithful and just to, he's just, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you of half of your unrighteousness. What's that? All of your unrighteousness. Anything not right with him. Anything not right with him. Now, there's verse 10, and then there's chapter 2 and verse 1. Let's look at that. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. My little children, these things I write to the world. What's that? To you. Oh, to you. So these are to the children of God. These verses are to the church. 
These are to church folk. These are to, to, to believers. These are to people that are right with God. My little children, I write these to you that you sin not. But if any man does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen. And this isn't an encouragement to sin any more than Romans chapter 6 is. Romans chapter 6 says you're under grace. Romans chapter 6 says you are under God's grace. Now, should we sin so that grace may abound? It says every sin, every time you sin, there's more grace. Every time you sin, there's more grace. Every time you commit a sin, there's more grace. Every time you miss it, every time you stumble and fall, every time you transgress any of God's instructions or commandments, any time you fail, even, even, even unintentionally, on. Amen. my pastor's preaching and you go, oh, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. There's more grace. And so Romans 6 says, should we sin that grace abounds? God forbid. God forbid. That's not, that's not an excuse to, to go on and live in sin. The book of Titus says that the grace of God that appears freely to all men teaches us to deny ungodliness and live soberly and righteously and, and holy in this present life, in this present world. But just because you do sin, that doesn't mean God gives up on you. God throws in the towel. God rejects you. God blots your name out of the, 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 the Lamb's book of life. And you're cursed now and you're going to hell forever because you've sinned. No, it, no. If, if a believer sins, we have an advocate with God. Your sin is not bigger than the Lord Jesus Christ. Your sin has, has not more power than the blood that was shed of the lamb that was slain. Your sin is not greater than the grace that was given us and the mercy that endures forever. Your mistake and your human frailty and your human weakness and your thinking that that's so big that God can't forgive you, you need to repent of pride, first of all. You're greater than God and something that you can do and some, some little way you can, you can falter, some little way that you can fail and some way that you miss it is greater than God's all empowerment of grace? No, grace abounds. God's grace abounds. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. Yeah, God's grace, greater than all my sin. But the devil lies to people. Demons lie to people and say, yeah, but yeah, but he doesn't know what you did. And he doesn't know what you said. And he didn't know what you're thinking about. And he, he just says, no, doesn't matter. I'm not the God of the universe. I, I work for him. Represent him and speak on his behalf. And his grace is greater than all your sin. Well, well, pastor, well, pastor. Now I'm going to quote that same minister. This is the third time I've quoted him. First was somebody trying to argue with, with uh, that, that I, I just don't believe we're the righteousness of God. Well, that's what the Bible says. Second was, you make it too easy to be forgiven of sin. Well, I didn't write the Bible. That's what he told him. I didn't write the Bible. The Bible said, confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive yes. you. Yes. Faithful and just to forgive you. Anything. Yes. Everything. Yes. Cleanse you of oh. all unrighteousness, anything that's not right. Yeah. Anything that's not right. I'm going to quote that same minister now. Third thing. He said, there are more people that turn their back on Christ and... And, see, they had these back in that day. They don't anymore. And are in insane asylums. Remember him saying that? More people in insane asylums and more people that turn their back on their faith in Christ because they believe they've committed the unpardonable sin than any other single spiritual reason. Quote, Dr. Kenneth E. Hagin. <clears throat> The devil is relentless. Demons are just absolutely relentless. But I did read that 
long suffering was one of the fruits of the Spirit, and I can wait him out. Come on. Come I have the powerment of God on the inside to stand my ground and stand and stand, and having done all to stand. And when the smoke clears away and the dust all settles and the fog blows clear, I'll still be standing. My house will not fall. But, but boy, the temptation will rage to, well, well, yeah, but you committed the unpardonable sin. Well, if I've committed the unpardonable sin, sure, I'm going to want to throw my hands up in the air and go crawl off into a dark corner somewhere and just fade away from, from my earthly existence. Because you think God doesn't love you anymore? Because you think you, you, you did something so, so awesomely, horribly, terribly bad that, that he can't forgive you? There's only one unpardonable sin, and that's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And I can't even find half a dozen ministers to agree on what that means. You get every definition under the sun. When you start asking people, what does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? What does that actually mean? See, the Bible teaches us, the Bible teaches us that it's possible to grieve the Holy Spirit. To grieve God's Spirit. The Bible teaches that it's possible to quench the Holy Spirit. To limit the Holy Spirit. To insult the Holy Spirit. To resist the Holy Spirit. And to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Now, let's just give a few definitions to some of these, some of these terms. Um, <clears throat> grieving the Holy Spirit, uh, there are translations that, that just use the term disappointing. Disappointing the Holy Spirit. Think you've ever been guilty of disappointing the Holy Spirit? I mean, if he's, if he's just tugging at your heart to walk across a restaurant and, and give a track to that individual that's, that, that, that's sitting there and just sit one down and, 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 and you, oh, you, know, you know, I don't know if this is the Lord or not. You know, you've been praying for six months, God speak to me, God speak to me. He says, go over there and give that person a track and tell him I love him. And, 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 and now you're fidgeting. And, and, and at any time that, at any time that, that you refuse the Holy Spirit's leading, uh, the Bible calls that grieving the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul did it in Acts chapter 20. Everywhere I go, the Holy Spirit assigns people to come and tell me not to do this, but I'm going to do it. Don't look so innocent. <clears throat> Grieve the Holy Spirit. The Bible never says that's an unpardonable sin. If it comes to your attention, ask the Lord to forgive you. If it doesn't, just ask him to forgive you of something so he can cleanse you of everything else that's not right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19. Uh, this, is a, this is an interesting, you might just want to turn there. 1 Thessalonians, these are the verses, you know, that, that you know, we, we, we learn, we sing choruses about them. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything of thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. See, quench not the Spirit here is continued on in verse 20 that says don't despise the, the inspired utterances of the Lord. That would include preaching. And that's why some of your translations uh, say do not despise godly preaching. See, there are people that... Uh, they hear the word of God preached and they just set things down and they just fold their arms and they just wag their head and, and they despise the word of God. That's called quenching the spirit. He's trying to get your attention. He's trying to speak to your heart. He's trying to set your life aright. He's trying to set you up straight. 
He's trying to correct some issues and some things in your thought life. Maybe your motives, maybe your intentions. He's, he's trying to wipe selfishness away from you. He's trying to take worry out of you. And, yeah. and, 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 and you, just, you, just, you just withhold that. You just press back on that. That's called quenching the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is a fire. The first manifestation of the Holy Spirit was were fire. He said, you'll be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. Yes. And that fire is burning, and that fire is getting closer and closer to you. And that fire is about ready to catch your pant leg and burn some stuff away from you. And you take a bucket of water and you pour it on it. And you quench that fire. You put it out. You put it out. That's not an unpardonable sin. That's not an unpardonable sin. You might want to look back with me at the 78th Psalm. Psalm 78. Ready? Now this is talking about the Israelites. We like reading about them. Except where it reflects us. Now, I'm not going to read every, every reference to this, but, uh, but I'll just give you a couple. Uh, verse 57, again, this is talking about the Israelites, Psalm 78 and verse 57. What does it say they did? They turned back. They turned back. The, the previous verse says, They tempted and provoked the Most High God and kept not His testimonies and turned back and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. Look at your neighbor and say, never turn back. Don't ever turn back. See, in verse 41, it says, yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. You can limit the Holy Spirit. He wants to do more. He wants to take you farther. He wants to show you. He wants to reveal. He wants to open those scriptures. He wants to embolden you. He wants to educate you and, 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 and mature you and develop you. And he wants to perfect you. He wants to prosper you. He wants to use you. But you limit the Holy One of Israel when you back up. When you say, I won't. When you say, that's not for me. When you say, uh, uh, I'm too young. When you say, oh, I'm a woman. When you say, well, I'm a man. When you say, well, I can't do that. When you say, I was born on the wrong side of the track, so my skin is the wrong color. Well, I don't have an education. Come on, Pastor. When you use any of those excuses and, and, and you just back away from what the Lord wants you to do, that's called limiting the Holy One of Israel. You can limit the Holy Spirit, and that's not an unpardonable sin. See, you can grieve the Holy Spirit and go to heaven. You can quench the Holy Spirit and go to heaven. You can limit the Holy Spirit and go to heaven. Look at Acts chapter 7. This is one of the best messages you've ever heard in your life. Well, not the one I'm preaching, the one in Acts chapter 7. Yeah, Stephen, he's, he's preaching away here in Acts chapter 7. And, and he, comes down to, uh, <clears throat> he comes down to verse 51. I mean, I've never said this, Brother Kimberling, Reverend. I've never said this. He says, you stiff-necked, uncircumcised of heart and ears. That's what he said to him. I mean, you you have. I believe you have. Yeah. I believe it. (laughs) You stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do you. You can resist the Holy Ghost. You can resist the Holy Ghost. But that's not the unpardonable sin. So, so far, we've seen in our body, you can grieve the Holy Spirit, you can quench the Holy Spirit, you can limit the Holy Spirit, you can insult the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 10. And depending on the, the uh, 
depending on the translation that you have, this one that I'm reading right now gives that, gives that, that wording that it says insult. They insult the Holy Spirit. They insult Verse 29, much sore punishment thought they worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God to count the blood of the covenant, and he was sanctified with an unholy thing and has done despite the Spirit of grace. And in the margin there it says insulted the Spirit of grace. Insulted the Spirit of grace. Insulting the Holy Spirit. And yet that's not the unpardonable sin. Turn over to uh, the Gospels with me. Turn over to the Gospels with me. And we're going to read out of, uh, let's start with Mark. Uh, this is also found in Matthew chapter 12 and Luke chapter 12. But let's, 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 let's start with, this okay? Yeah. You okay with this? Yeah. All right, let's, let's start with, with, with the book of Mark chapter 3, and then we'll turn over to, to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Uh, Mark chapter 3, Jesus, uh, let's, let's just start all the way up with uh, verse 10. For he healed, he healed many insomuch that they pressed upon him to touch as many as had plagues. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and they cried out saying what? What, what, did, what did the demons say? You are the son of God. So demons have that much straight. Yeah, devils even know that. And he charged them that they should not make him known. And he went up to a mountain, and, and that's where he uh, ordained the, uh, the 12 disciples. Uh, that's when he came down. The multitude was pressing upon him, and his friends wanted to put him away. They said he's beside himself in verse 21. And the scribes came down and said, He has Beelzebub, and by the prince of devils he casts out devils. And he called them to him and said, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided in himself, it can't stand. If a house is divided, it can't stand. If Satan rises up against himself, he'll be divided, can't stand, and has an end. No man enters a strong man's house and spoils his goods, except he first binds the strong man, then he'll spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men. And blasphemies were who? Whithersoever they shall blaspheme, but he that blasphemes against the Holy Spirit shall never have forgiveness and is in danger of eternal damnation because they said he has an unclean spirit. Because they said he has an unclean spirit. Uh, so what's the unpardonable sin? What's the one sin that, that you cannot be forgiven of? Right here, in regard to the Holy Spirit. It's not grieving, it's not quenching, it's not limiting, it's not insulting, it's not resisting. It's not ignoring. We didn't have that one on our list, did we? No, it's not ignoring the Holy Spirit. And, and you know, you can ignore your wife. You can ignore your kids. You can ignore your husband. You can, you can ignore your boss. You can ignore the fire alarm. La, 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 la. You can ignore your pastor. You, you, can, you, can, you can ignore the Holy Spirit. Again, he's, he's, he's prompting you. He's, he's urging you. Come away and pray. Come away and pray. I remember here, here in Norville Hayes, say, I was in my hotel room, and, and I was all snuggled up in the covers, and it was late at night, and I'd had a meeting, and, and I crawled into bed, and I pulled the covers all up. For me. Ooh, the pillow was so comfy in that hotel room. The temperature was just right. And, and the Holy Spirit started to impress within his heart. Son, I want you to pray. Son, I want you to pray. Son, get up and pray. Son, come and pray. I want you to get up. Get on your knees and pray. Son, get up and pray. Son, I want you to pray. You need to pray. Son, get up and pray. Oh, he said the bed got even more comfortable. I closed my eyes a little tighter, and it was so, I pulled those covers up, and it was so nice. And he said, son, pray. I want you to pray. I want you to get up and pray. Son, get up and get on your knees beside the bed, and I want you to pray. And he said, finally, I said to myself, I think the Lord wants me to pray. <laughs> you know what you can do? You can ignore that. 
You can roll over and go to sleep. I want you to go to church. Yeah, but it's been such a long day, but I want you to go to church. There's going to be a great, great message for you tonight. I want you in my presence. I want to help you. I want you to go to church. See? And, and you can ignore that. The Holy Spirit won't force you to obey our God. But he will lead you and every child of God. Romans chapter 8. So don't ignore the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> but if you did, that's not the unpardonable sin. The only unpardonable sin can't be pardoned is to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Go over to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, and, and, and we'll, see it, we'll see it here uh, very clearly. Luke chapter 12, starting, well, uh, again... Yeah, we'll start in verse 1. Be, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And then he talks some uh, about the Pharisee. And he gets to verse 8. Let's just pick it up in verse 8. Is that okay? Yes. All right, verse 8. Also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man confess before the angels of God. But he that denies me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven. Whosoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it'll never be forgiven. Now, what was it that they were criticizing? What was it that these people were, were being critical of? And what exactly were they saying? What exactly were they saying? You have to go back into chapter 11, and you'll see some of the identical reference that we just read in Mark chapter 3 that's also in Matthew chapter 12. Luke chapter 11, verse 14, he was casting out a dumb devil. They're all dumb. <laughs> he was cast, this, that means he, he, this person couldn't speak. He was casting out a demon, and the mute person then spoke. Verse 15, some of them said, he casts out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of devils. And he answered them, again, no kingdom divided against itself, no house divided against itself. And he says this in verse 20. But if I, with the finger of God, and what does that mean? What does the finger of God mean? Need, need somebody that can read it, can run up here really, really quick. What's that word right there? Power. The power, thank you. He said, if I, by the power of God, am casting out devils, no doubt then the kingdom of God has come to you. Their blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now listen real carefully. If you go back and you, 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 you think about what he's speaking about here. Luke chapter 12. What's he speaking about? Verse 8, whoever confesses me in front of men, I'll confess in heaven. Whoever rejects me here, I'll reject there. Whoever denies me here, denies me there. That's what they were doing. They were denying the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were denying that him casting out that devil <clears throat> came because he was empowered by God. They were denying that he was God's son. They were denying Acts 10, 38, how, he, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and heal all who were oppressed of the devil. They said, <clears throat> he's doing this through the devil. They were rejecting him as God's son, rejecting him as the Messiah, rejecting him and, and, and everything that he was doing, they were not attributing to God's anointing on his life. They were attributing to the devil. 
That's a rejection of Jesus Christ. And that is the unpardonable sin. It will result in eternal damnation. And it's the only thing. And that's the rejection of Christ. You accept Christ, you become immediately declared right with God. Don't. And that's exactly what they did. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you in heaven. If you deny me or reject me right here in front of men, which is what they were doing. That's called blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. He, he didn't come. He's not anointed by the Holy Spirit. He's doing this through demons. They're rejecting Christ. Plain and simple, simplest definition you'll, you'll, you'll hear on that. It's rejection of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Rejection of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And it is the only sin that can't be forgiven. You have to You must, it's required that you be born again, that you accept Jesus Christ and accept his lordship and accept that God sent him and accept that he's his son and accept that there is no other way. And they wouldn't do that. They attributed his ministry success and his power to devils instead of to God. They didn't reject just that one miracle or that one deliverance or that one demon that was cast out. Notice what else he said? He said, he said, he said, you can even criticize me and you can be forgiven of it. He said, blasphemy against the son of man. You remember reading that in, in, in Mark chapter three? Go back to Matthew, show it to you again. Matthew chapter 12. Are you there? Matthew chapter 12, verse 32. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, see, what they were saying was, he didn't do this by the Holy Spirit. He did this by demons. See, you can criticize him. He said, you can criticize me and you can get away with it. What they didn't say is, he's just doing this by his own power. Some of you are still just looking at me like, I just don't get it, Pastor. I'm, I'm, all right, I'm going I'm 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 to try to make it a little simpler. It's nowhere on the same scale. But you see, you, you all were so kind and so, so sweet and, and, and so honorable. And, and presented me with a basket of cards today. And, and uh, you show so much love in this congregation. Thank you again. But not everybody does that. Not everybody does that. I do my best to just be honest and say, the reason I pastor is because one day the living God interrupted my life's journey. And I heard his voice from heaven say, move to La Crosse and pastor Living Word Church. And I dropped on my knees right in those same, never took another step, dropped on my knees right there in those steps uh, and, and, and said, uh, yes, yeah, I'll do that. On August the 23rd of 1985, I had an open heavenly vision and watched the call of God come right down and just rest right on top of me and heard the audible voice of God say, I've called you and I've anointed you as a pastor in my body and a shepherd over a flock of my sheep. <clears throat> and I, I, I do my best to give the honor and the glory and the credit that all the praise would go to to him for that. But I still have people that say, I don't think God appeared to you. I don't think God spoke to you. I don't think, I think you just do that because you're good at public speaking. You know something? You can say that and get away with it. You can say that and be forgiven of that because you're just talking about me as a, as a person. But if you say, I see what you're doing supernaturally and I think it's demonic. Yeah. Now, now you've taken 
the glory that should go to the great and almighty and living God and our Savior who made the choice and did the calling and the separation. Now you're messing with him. Now, when it comes to Jesus, now you can still do that and get away with it and be forgiven of it. You can do that. But when it comes to Jesus, he said right there, he said, you can criticize me all you want. You can blaspheme the Son of Man and you can be forgiven of that. But you can't say God didn't send him and you can't say he's not God's son and you can't say he's not divine in divinity and you can't say he's not anointed of heaven and you can't say he's not the Messiah and ever be forgiven of that. And that's exactly what they did. He's doing miracles. He's given our God the credit how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And they were saying, God's not with him. God didn't anoint him. God didn't send him. He is not the Savior. He's not the Messiah. And they rejected him. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you in heaven. If you reject me in front of men, you'll be rejected in heaven. That's the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin is rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only one that there'll be no forgiveness for. There's been a glorious provision for every single solitary other sin, transgression, and all iniquity, even mistakes and shortcomings. But you can't go to heaven and say, <clears throat> I never accepted you, Jesus. I rejected you. Please forgive me. There's no forgiveness of that. You have to accept him. You have to receive him. Let's bow our heads together. If you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ personally, as your Savior, and He's the Lord of your life. You're doing your best to submit to Him and live for Him, and you're doing your best to please Him and obey Him. Even if you trip up once in a while and, and, and stumble on occasion, uh, you're in a good place. You're in the best of places. You're in the family of God. You're in the beloved. You're in the body of Christ. You're in the church and you've been declared right with Him. If everything about your life, every decision you make, every determination, every moment of every minute of every day, on occasion, once in a while, maybe once a week, maybe once a month, maybe once an hour, you struggle with something that's not right, a thought, a word, an attitude that may need some attention. Don't be discouraged. Don't give up hope. Don't throw your hands up and say, I'll never make it. No, you're, 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 you're working out your own salvation. You're fighting the good fight of faith. I know whenever I get a, a, a phone call and, and somebody says, Pastor, I'm struggling. I always say the same thing. Keep struggling. Keep in the fight. Stay in the fight. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't, don't, don't run up the white flag. Life is a fight. Fight sin. Fight temptation. Fight depression. Fight demons. Fight everything contrary to God and His Word. But it doesn't mean you're not right with God. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, if He's not the Lord of your life, if, you, if you've never done that, I'm going to invite our altar ministry staff to quietly come to the altar right now. Keep your heads bowed as you come too. 
And if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to come to the altar and approach one of these folks to pray with you this morning. If you're streaming with us, if you're, if you're viewing with us, you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to pray with us in these next moments. And I want you to put your faith and trust in the only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if as while we're praying, you have areas in life that, that you know need some attention, you know aren't right, you know you struggle with, you're in church. This is a time to say, Lord, I recommit again to be a Christian man, to be a Christian woman, to be a Christian couple, to be a Christian family, to be a Christian business leader, to be a Christian school teacher, to be a, 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 a Christian, no matter what, what you do for employment, to be a Christian neighbor, to be a Christian member of, of, of my family. And make a commitment, Lord, as you show it to me in the Bible, in your word, I will through and by your power, I will live that word out. And I'll demonstrate righteousness and practice righteousness and pursue righteousness. And I'll live righteously right in your sight. Now, if you're viewing, I want you to pray with me right now, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. And I'm not going to give you a magic word. I'm not going to give you some words to repeat that if you say this, now you'll be, now you'll be okay with the Lord. I want you, wherever you are, to talk to God. And yeah, you can do it out loud. And acknowledge that today you are accepting His Son as your Savior and putting your trust on what he did on the cross and shedding his blood and giving his life for you. Just talk to him and say, I want to accept your son today. I want to accept you, Lord Jesus, and what you did for me. I want to put my faith in you today. And from this day forward, Jesus, I confess that you are my Savior. And Lord Jesus, that you're my Lord. Please confess me in heaven. One day, I'm confessing today that Jesus, you're my Lord. You go ahead and pray. You talk to God. Don't repeat after me. You talk to the Lord and let him know that you accept his son as Savior and confess him as Lord of your life. Now, if you do that for the very first time, if you'll contact our office, if you'll, uh, on our website, request, we'll send you some, we'll send you some helpful literature, some, some, some books and some articles just to help you as you grow as a Christian. I want to encourage you to continue to watch our broadcast and continue to connect with us this way. And I'll help you be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, one who will be unashamed to stand before him on that day and hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I love you. Thank you for watching this morning and being part of our congregation in that way. And in our congregation here, let's all stand. Now, any prayer that, that, that you may ask for, uh, any need that you may have, our altar ministry staff is up here at the altar on both sides. You know, one of these weeks, I'm going to get, I've got, I've got about 40 scriptures out of just four books of the Bible, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, all verses that tell us how to live right in God's sight. Not how to be right in God's sight, that's 2 Corinthians, that's, that's, that's Romans, that's 1 Peter, but Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thought I'd get at it today, and the board is still white. I love pastor, and I get to come back next Sunday morning. So if the Lord doesn't come in, the, in between there, I'll see you back here Sunday morning. We also have Wednesday night service. Love to see you all there, 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights. And we're studying, uh, we study our Bible uh, there as well. Got some other things for our kids and young people also. Uh, this morning, as soon as we say amen,
there's cake out here. And we've already been encouraged to hang around and fellowship some over that. So glory to God. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all uh, very much for uh, your honor and your love. Uh, I want you to know that Paul and I, that I, as your pastor, I know you only have one. Some people get confused about it. Some people are confused about it right now. They think they've got somebody on the internet that's kind of half their pastor. You know, people, people get, they get tripped up over it. They get, they, 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 they kind of wonder who the pastor is around here. No need to wonder. Yeah, don't need to. Paul is not your pastor. She doesn't want to be. She says, please don't call me pastor. I'm not one. Never been called to be one. Not anointed to be one. I wouldn't want to be one. Uh, if, I, if, if you're not called anointed. But with God's help, I just continue to plug along. Uh, and I thank you for staying faithful as well. Thanks for being committed. Thanks for being a Christian, Christ-like one. God bless you. I love you. We're dismissed in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching The Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church. Living Word Christian Church welcomes you to join us at 2015 Ward Avenue in La Crosse, Wisconsin, Sunday mornings at 8.15 and 10.30, and Wednesday evenings at 7. For more information on Living Word Christian Church, visit us on the web at lwcclax.com.